Hi, welcome everybody. This is uh, the Tom Sumner program for the uh, for the internet. And uh, joining me here in the studio, I'll uh, do a couple of quick uh, introductions. And uh, we have a very special guest by phone that we'll start out with. But as always, uh, to my far right, uh, we have Flint's premier political pundit, Paul Rosie. It's always good to be here. And uh, on, on my left, uh, the uh, Founder of the Three R's Group, president of that group, and a candidate for uh, Flint's school board, Leon L. Alamin, and we have uh, Jermaine, who's uh, taking pictures, pictures from behind me here. Uh, but joining me, uh, we're going to have a, a very interesting conversation. One that I, I don't think we can have uh, often enough or deeply enough, and that is uh, about race relations. Uh, a lot of people are talking about it, but we're going to explore whether they're asking the right questions and having the right conversations a little bit. And uh, to kick things off, I was uh, really amazed to learn that there's a uh, Jim Crow Museum in the state of Michigan. I, I had not heard of it. Paul had. I, I have seen the, the, the display a couple times at Mott College when you had a traveling exhibit that you brought by. But it made me curious, and I wanted to talk a little bit uh, about, that, uh, about that place and also with its uh, founder who joins us now by phone. He is the Vice President for Diversity and Race Relations at Ferris State University in Big Rapids and the founder and curator of the uh, Jim Crow Museum, Dr. David Pilgrim. Doctor, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. I'm going to ask you a couple of uh, Jim Crow Museum questions that you probably get asked all the time. Why is it important to keep some of these uh, images alive? Uh, a couple things. One, we, we have about 11,000 objects. Uh, one of your guests mentioned having seen an ex exhibition. That's actually one of our traveling e exhibitions, mm -hmm. which probably has uh, somewhere between 30 and 50 pieces. But if you could imagine 11,000 pieces, you know, that's, that's quite a different display. In the Jim Crow Museum, you would find, you know, uh, what some people might simply call American history uh, uh, pieces. Uh, you'd also find segregation memorabilia. You would find... Um, um, anti-black caricature pieces. You'd find some hard-to-look-at pieces, for example, the, the section that deals with violence. But you would also find sections that deal with uh, African-American achievement despite that. Uh, you'd find a section on the Civil Rights Movement, for example. I have one of the ink pens that President uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson used to sign the 1964 Civil Rights, uh, uh, yeah, Civil Rights Act. Uh, but to answer your question, uh, we believe it's important to learn about all history. Um, unfortunately, uh, the museum also has a section on modern pieces, so it's not just material from the past. In other words, these are not things that stayed in the past, but we find some um, uh, of the same types of images and messages being reproduced uh, in the present. So the reason we have the museum and the reason that I created it was so that there would be a safe space to talk intelligently and deeply about race, race relations, and racism. You know, I found it interesting that one of the uh, one of the comments uh, from the frequently asked questions about the uh, Jim Crow Museum was uh, about the the images that were offensive. And there are disclaimers and cautions. <laughs> you know, sort of. You know. It, it, if you look at this, you might be offended by this. And there's a lot of uh, talk going on around the country now in the wake of uh, what happened in um, outside of St. Louis in uh, Ferguson. Ferguson. But at the same time, we're having what seems to some people like kind of a silly conversation about the Washington Redskins. Mm -hmm. um, are, are these really kind of the same thing in some ways? Well, I think that they are they're different points on, on, on a long continuum. Uh, objects matter. Um, actually, you could make the argument, argument that images and objects, that they both reflect and shape. So 
so they reflect existing views, but they also shape uh, future views. Um, you know, a piece doesn't have to, quote, be racist to be in the museum, but it has to be a piece that allows us to talk about race that actually helps that discussion. Um, you know, I, we've had thousands of visitors. We've had people come from Australia uh, using the museum as a template to build a similar facility that, that deals with ab Aborigines. Uh, we've had Henry Louis Gates, the Harvard professor, come, and um, Henry Rollins just shot an episode for uh, his History Channel show, The mm -hmm. Ten Things You Don't Know About. Uh, we are an academic facility. In other words, we're not a shrine to racism. We believe in the triumph of dialogue. I mean, how could it be otherwise? We're educators. And if you are uh, in an educational environment, the expectation is, is that you're going to talk about, you know, for example, if you're talking about history, you're going to talk about all of history, not just the happy history. Um, and you're going to talk about it in a, in, a, in a way that's deeper than hopefully what you would in a bar. So <laughs> we, Although I think so, some pretty good conversations go on in bars. Sometimes that's true. I, I was going to ask a question, well, too. Uh, has there ever been an object that, that you found so offensive that you had second thoughts about displaying it? And What I'm thinking about here is I think a display they had a, a few years ago, I believe, at the uh, uh, African American History Museum in Detroit, the series of photographs on lynchings. Right. And they made postcards of those things. So, did, you, did right. you ever have any hesitation about displaying certain objects because they were so uh, over the top or so offensive? Well, to, uh, first of all, I'm aware. I think that's the um, what's it called? Without Sanctuary uh, exhibition. Right. That they had that's right. Pitching. We have some of those same postcards. We display enough of that material just to make the point that we're making. Uh, there's only there's only been one piece that. Um, and it was actually donated to the museum, that we, you know, and, and by we in this case, I mean, I, I, I kind of was the tiebreaker and decided that, no, we won't show this. We don't need to show this object in, in order to teach the lesson we're trying to teach. And that was a lynching souvenir, which was, um, there's no other way to say it. It was a, you know, a really small part of a person, you know, like, um, mm. uh, you know, like a part of a, right. you know, maybe a, eight, ten inch piece of um, skin or so. We don't need to show that to to talk about lynching, to talk about the role of lynching, um, what precipitated it, what were the consequences of it, what was the context of it. We don't need to show that to do that. Um, most of the pieces in the museum are pieces um, that are much less offensive. And in a weird way, that means they produce better conversations. So if it's a piece that has the word nigga in it or some other racist slur, that kind of decreases the, the conversation because no matter where you are, most people just think, okay, that's bad. What else is there to talk about? But when you have pieces like a mammy image, which for some people represents a kind of nostalgic, and I don't mean it in a flippant way, but a kind of nostalgic time uh, reminisce a uh, uh, memory of time spent with their family and to someone else it represents the vestiges of slavery and, and segregation mm -hmm. the value of the museum is is that we put both those people in the same place so that they can talk and more importantly that they can listen so for us again it's an academic facility uh, obviously you know it's not academic in the sense of just pictures in a book um, and people, when confronted with many of these objects, will have an emotional response. But our intent is 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 to use the objects to facilitate intelligent discussions. You know, I want. Uh, there's so many things that uh, that come to mind that I'd love to discuss with you, uh, maybe at a later date. And I appreciate you being available to to weigh in a little bit. Uh, at the uh, top of this uh, conversation we're going to have in a couple of minutes, we're going to go to the uh, people here in the studio and, and get into some of this conversation. But I want to ask you the big overall question that I've been scratching my head about for the last six or seven years, and that is how we got from uh, civil rights legislation in the 60s to electing a black president in 2008 without getting a better handle on, on racism. Also, before you answer that, well, sir, um, this is I, I would, 
I, I would kind of push back a little bit with the question by saying that, uh, for, you know, first of all, I'll preface it with this. I think we are now, as a nation, more egalitarian and more democratic than we've ever been. That does not mean that, that there still are not challenges mm -hmm. uh, and that race matters in a way that it probably still should not matter. But we, we are not the same nation that we were in the past. And I'm not using the election of President Obama singularly as evidence of that. I mean, I felt that way before that election. Mm -hmm. um, but to push back to your question a little bit, what I would say is we, we have not had sustained intelligent dialogue on a national level but we have had many, many, many years of many people having intelligent discussions about race. So many of those discussions were invisible, and by that I mean they were small group discussions. They mm -hmm. were, you know, discussions in hallways, discussions in, in at the corridors, in you know, in, in in our offices. They were, you know, they were discussions in college classrooms. So I think there has been a lot of dialogue. I don't think there's been always intelligent dialogue, uh, but there's been there's been a lot of dialogue about Jim Crow. You know, we've now had, um, you know, 50 years or so. And actually, if you notice, we're celebrating all the, you know, 50 anniversary of right. voting's right, right and all the like. Yeah. 50 years in the in the scheme of the universe is not very long, but in the history of the U.S. is a fairly large chunk of time. And I think that, um, you know, in that 50 years, um, you know, uh, again, although there are challenges, there has been significant dialogue and there's been significant progress. Well, Doctor, I, like I said, there are many more conversations or many more questions and aspects of this that I'd uh, like to talk with you about. But one last question, and, and I'll let you go and we'll get into our discussion here in the studio. But uh, uh, do you have a sense that, that there's a reluctance to really get inside this discussion and and who feels that more blacks or whites well okay that's <laughs> that's really broad I, I would to the first part of your question yes um i i travel a lot i speak to a lot of groups and for many years now i think there's been kind of a fatigue about race um almost a you know sad um maybe naive desire to get to a point where we no longer have to talk about it. And, you know, it's weird because you wouldn't do that with issues related to men and women. I mean, you wouldn't wake up one day and say, okay, fine, we got that resolved. There's no need for us a nation to talk about men and women anymore. Well, the same thing is with race. It's, it's, it's like sex or, or gender identity or sexual uh, orientation in a number of topics. I think the the trick is is to find the image, I mean the energy, and the maturity as a nation to keep having those discussions, and just try to find intelligent ways to do it to to get beyond the sort of partisan poli political sides of it, and actually just sit and if you allow me, I'll I'll just tell you about one experience I had recently. Please. I was at West Western Michigan University and. One of my old colleagues was there, um, Khalid El Hakim, uh, one of my old students actually, who's now a colleague, and he's created the Black History 101 Museum, and he had a few of his pieces with him. They have pieces very similar to what you would find in the Jim Crow Museum. And so I sat around with a class of undergraduate students at um, Western. I think they were art students. And we sat in a circle, and we had a very simple exercise. We would pass a, a, a piece around a bank, you know, that had a caricatured image or a photograph or whatever. We had like five or six pieces. And then people would just answer some basic questions, which were, when you see this, what is it you see? And then, why do you say that? Now, that sounds very simple, and it was, but it gave the folk there an opportunity to, to listen. It was the deepest conversation I've been in about race probably in the last 20 years. Wow. And I remember thinking as I was doing that, that if we could just carton off some space and have people put aside this, again, the pol partisan political stuff and 
some of the other you know some of the other baggage including emotional baggage about race and just sit and just say you know or answer the question what is it that i see and have others listen and not condemn not crush not beat each other up but just listen i think the more we do that as a nation the more times we do it and the better we do that especially the listening part, then we come closer to answering all the big things about race and some other issues. David, thank you so much for uh, spending this time and, and for <clears throat> returning my call on very short notice. Hopefully we can uh, get together and spend a little longer. I'd love to talk some more about Well, you're some welcome of these to things. come to Big Rapids. It's a, it's a, a metropolitan area. It's um, the 1,500 miles north of Miami. <laughs> well, fortunately, I'm I'm here in Michigan, so it's okay. uh, it's not 1,500 miles from me, and I intend to come visit, and I hope to meet you okay. in person. Thank well, you so much. To do that. Thank you. Have a good day. All right. All right. Dr. All right, David bye. Pilgrim is the uh, Vice President for Diversity and Race Relations at Ferris State University in Big Rapids and the founder and curator of the Jim Crow Museum there. Uh, and, and again, thank you to him for, for joining us. But I also want to welcome Leon L. Alamine. He was dying to get in there. And I know, I, I know my friend Leon loves to talk. And uh, I had to hold him off because I wanted to get the, uh, the, the professor uh, in and out fairly quickly. But um, how, how, did, how did that feel? Were you aware that there was a museum like that in Michigan? I wasn't. No, I actually wasn't. And that's what I was sparking that up. I wanted to ask a question. I actually want to know where that's located and get that information. I would love to go. I can get that to you. That. It's in Big Rapids, okay. uh, and they they have a Facebook page. You can you can check them out. They have a great website, and um, it's uh, at Ferris University. So you could probably go to Ferris State, and you know there'd be a tab to you know you can you can track them down. And I I, I highly recommend it. It was. Uh, an eye opener for me. I stumbled wow. across it sort of by accident. And as I was saying, they have a traveling exhibition. They've had it a couple of years, a couple of times at Mott's. And I don't know about this year if it's going to be on the Mott campus or not. But with some regularity, they brought their traveling exhibit to the to Mott College as well. Who who is more uncomfortable <clears throat> having the kind of intelligent discussion that Dr. Pilgrim was talking about um, when when discussions about race come up? In, in your opinion, Leon, do you, you, th you think it's whiteies like me or, uh, or, or are, are black people? I would say those, when we're looking at blacks, I would say those who have uh, achieved some form of success, who are experiencing um, some success in the democratic process and things of that nature. I mean, we really don't too much have a middle class, but I'm going to say I'm going to use the term for just the sake of speaking those who may have crossed to the middle class or above, they will be more um, uncomfortable talking about it. And I would think mm -hmm. individuals like yourself, Tom, in regards to white people, I would think that um, individuals who are well off as well will be more uncomfortable just because of the privileges in which one has attained or the success. And when you get to a level of success and you're comfortable in it, you kind of feel like you don't want to go back and address certain issues. So I think it depends on what what level you are. That, that's in, that's interesting. The idea being that if you if, if everything is going well for you, you don't really want to know about bad mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, you don't want to deal with those kinds of issues. But there's I, I hear this, and this was interesting. I had lunch with a, a friend yesterday uh, who represents a, a Hispanic organization and she's always using the the phrase community to talk about the Hispanic community and I've and I've heard black friends do this too mm -hmm. to, to talk about the black community have we in the in the process of moving forward just, sort of fallen into separate but equal communities? I think we've been there. Um, yeah. but, well, that's what, that's what I'm getting at. Is, is that why we're not having the conversation or able to have the conversations um, in profound ways? Exactly. I think um, individuals are already always comfortable with those who um, they can relate to a little better or however you want to put that. So 
I mean, uh, maybe media or so forth may have put that out there to where like we're all as one. But the reality is we not have been all as one or all American. And you can look at it from an economical standpoint, an educational standpoint, and things of that nature and go across the board and statistics will prove that we we are already been segregated and separated and we look at it more or less our groups or our nationalities and, and things of that nature. I mean, to be politically correct, at times individuals may get on camera and, and so forth and say we're all American. But the reality is when you see things as Trayvon Martin and Mike Brown and things of this nature, and I just was looking at a statistic before I came over here, between 2006 and 2012, <coughs> there were at least two black males unarmed killed by white police officers. You know, and this is a tissue by police. This is police data. So things of this nature continues just to, to prove even more the way how some individuals may see things the way I'm seeing it right now and will go with that level of thinking. Paul, Paul Rosicki uh, is a uh, political science instructor at my community college. Right. In the classes that you teach, do you notice something different over the years that you've been doing it is is there are there differences in the perception of the questions surrounding race and race relations generationally I think so I think so and I think my, my, my initial reaction to that question is that I think for younger African Americans I'm getting fewer questions than I used to I mean when I was talking to a class let's say in the 70s or 80s and for those who grew up during the Civil Rights Revolution, there would be a lot of energy in it. I'm not getting quite the same kind of energy there uh, in the last decade or two. Uh, another difference that I notice is this uh, in terms of, of the reaction. When I'm talking about race, you know, civil rights, the Brown case, things of that nature, uh, voting discrimination, the reaction I get depends on the audience. If I have a class where there's only, let's say, for example, one African American student, and that does happen occasionally, the reaction, depending on their personality, reaction is kind of a cringing thing. Oh, gee, now they're all looking at me. They're talking about race. <laughs> if, on the other, you know, I, I almost hate to do that. On the other hand, if I have, as this is much more common, you know, a half a dozen black students in the class, then the, the discussion really becomes very lively because people kind of feed off each other. But when you're kind of all by yourself, I, I've seen that reaction a number of times. Gee, if the this poor, poor, poor student out there, and everybody's looking at me, they're talking about race, and now I've got to say something that means something. Uh, but if there's a half a dozen people, then yeah, I get a very, very good discussion generally. But I have noticed a generational shift for those who kind of went through the civil rights movement of the 60s and maybe the 70s compared to those who've grown up in the last, let's say, 20 or so years. I, I was in a band once, and I'll just tell this quick story, and I want to get back to, uh, to, to Leon. But the, um, this band that I was in, Every time, it was, and it was an all-white band, every time a black couple or a group of black people would come in the room, the band leader would call a song like Respect by <laughs> or I Feel Good by James Brown, you know, to show that we were cool, you know. Yeah. And, and, and I always kind of hung my head when he did that. And, and I, it was... It was well-intentioned, but it was flaky at best and racist at worst. Exactly. And, and the thing is, how, how often are efforts to reach out, how often do they themselves become unintended racist acts? Mm. You know... Um... And, and, I'll, and I'll give you one more example of that. When I was a young boy, there was a phrase that went around that, that white people would use to show how not racist they were that became very offensive. Oh, and you know so, the one Some I'm, of my best friends are. Some of my Absolutely. best friends are colored. And colored Absolutely. was the word of the day. Yeah. And, and, it, and, it, and it was so funny because... It was well intentioned by most of the people but it came that across, I knew that were using yeah. it, but it it came across as what the hell does that mean? Exactly, and that just only proves the uncomfortability that one was still having. You know, when you still gotta relate when individuals will come around and say things of color or things of that nature that would you know um, 
not necessarily the proper thing to say, as you said, when you're banned or things of that nature. If we're looking at each other as human beings and as equals or as friends, I know you, Paul, or I know you, Tom, and we have feelings, you know, mm -hmm. regardless if you are of European descent, I'm of African descent, or regardless, you know, uh, if you're my friend and you're a human being, I judge you off the concepts of your character. I don't need to sponsor or edit my words when I'm around you because you know me. So that just goes to show even more the uncomfortability that individuals were having doing those occasions. Right, right. I'm, I'm glad you uh, referenced Dr. King's speech because I, another question that's been uh, rolling around in my head is, uh, you know, when, when Dr. King talked about the promised land, is that different for black people and white people? Do they have a different vision of, of what that is, the American dream, if you want to call it that? Um, well, you know, um, actually, that's going to be different for every race or nationality in this country because um, our vision, our goals is different to a degree. You know, um, what you might see as the promised land and what success or where you're trying to go might not necessarily be where I'm trying to go or what I might see as success or where I want to go. You know, um, is, is, that, is that part of the problem? Is that where programs have missed the mark by misjudging the finish line? Actually, we, we, it doesn't have to be part of the problem, but it has become part of the problem. I mean, there's nothing wrong. That way used to make America so beautiful, you know, democracy, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and things of this nature. And, but when certain individuals, corporations, or whatever you want to call it, begin to propagate and use those, those entities and those differences for the benefit of certain races or certain entities, so to say, then it becomes a problem. When you force your values, your culture, and your way on everyone else, then yeah, it becomes a problem. But if you're just expressing who you are and where you want to be, then so be it. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't hinder me or don't sidetrack me from where I'm trying to go. You know, it's, it's, it's plenty of room in this country we call America for everyone to express themselves. That was what, at one point in time, everyone was racing to get over here. Everyone wanted to be American. Everyone wanted to come share the American dream. But... Through the times, decades, and so forth, things didn't change. You know, individuals in certain classes who just have all the, the resources and powers, and that's just more or less you see it every day, forcing their way of life. You know, it's pretty much a rich and poor situation mm -hmm. that we're living in now. And it's if you're either on this side or on, your, on this side. And if you're on this side, you know, and your skin happens to be a d the different color of the majority who may be dominant in these resources and so forth, Caucasian or wherever um, nationality that may be, then this is where you get those issues and things of that nature. So it's, it depends on how you want to look at it. Paul, is there a... Uh, <laughs> definition for the American dream? I don't know. I mean, I suppose the simple one is you make money, you have a family, establish that, but I'm not sure there's a, clear, there's a single one. Uh, one of the one line. I mean, the American dream has been sold more than cornflakes. Yeah, you know, I think I think that's true. And, it's, and I think, uh, you know, I grew up, you know, the picket fence, in the, the two American kids dream. And the dog. And I, you know, yeah. here I am, fifty-seven years old, and I haven't got a clue what that is. <laughs> you know, anybody yeah. can be president. Okay, oh, I that's buy nice. That. Yeah, you know, everybody. Everybody's. Uh, I mean, I think we talk about making money, having a house. I say a house, a house, a picket fence, two kids. That's the American dream out of the 1950s, I guess. I'm not so sure it's true anymore. And I, I, and I, and I think from what Leon is saying, maybe, there is, maybe it's a far broader definition of self-success. I mean, you can be ex extremely unhappy, I think, on a picket fence and two that, kids and all that. But that's what I you wonder about, because efforts too. to make a difference, you know, any kind of an initiative starts out with this premise that there should be you know, achieved goals. Right. But the people who set out... There's a thousand different goals for people. Yeah. And, but so, usually yeah. a program will establish a particular goal. Yeah. You know, if you can, whether it's homeownership... Home, build or, more houses, pave more roads, whatever you exactly. Yeah, yeah. It, there's, there's some, uh, some end to that. John, I, I'm going to grab John's attention because I think one of our uh, other guests is just arrived, so might need a, uh, 
uh, some direction to get in here, but, but getting back on the point, um, you know, it occurs to me that people with the best intentions start out with a program, but use their own vision of Absolutely. success yeah. for, you and know, for, for where to try and get people to go and then can't figure out why people didn't go. Absolutely. I totally agree. And, and so they end or up with this. Or can't figure out why people don't like it once they get there because that's not what they wanted in the first place. I mean, I, I can recall some examples. <laughs> uh, some of those anti-poverty programs of the, of the 60s where you built all these huge towers that were just disasters in Chicago especially. They were well-engineered but they were horrible social ideas. I can think of examples where, with good intentions, I guess, uh, the government tried to move Indians into ranch houses and off their, their traditional land. And there, there well, there was the whole thing there. about the, you know, suit of clothes and the wagon absolutely. and, uh, yeah, absolutely. you know, drinking yeah. whiskey. Sure. Um, yeah. You know, and there, are, so and, I, there are, and there are other now, things that have now become comic, other images you know, the, the $40 and a mule comes to mind. Absolutely, the, the, yeah. The whiskey and yeah. uh, uh, Western clothes, you yeah. know, for Indians or who, Native Americans. But who, who defines that? Who really likes... But that's, but that's my point. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's been, you know, a country that was founded by primarily well-to-do white men. Right. And, How and it's... Is that correct? What's that? Is that correct? I'm talking about the founding documents, the group of people who sat around and drew up those documents okay, so so, as the founding okay. fathers. I'm not saying You're talking about that, the builders. that blacks yeah. or women yeah. or, or people yeah, from other countries yeah. didn't contribute significantly okay. to the evolution and to where we are now. But just that, that small group of white homeowners that sat down and drew up a document and again, with all the best intentions and with some pretty incredible outcomes. But the, the point is that a lot of the, the driving force of this country until recent decades have been driven by European descendants, primarily white people. And they've set as goals the goals they held that they thought had value, that they thought were important, and then expected people to get into these programs, reach those goals, and then everything would be fine. And they were stunned to find out that they weren't. Yeah. And it's, that's it's, because it's, we're it's, not asking the questions we should be, which is what I wanted to get into today well, if we can. Yeah, that's Good. a beautiful question, and that's something I would like to ask you two gentlemen, being Caucasian males. How do you feel about that? You know what I mean? I mean, I, of course, you may not be the, the wealthy elite, but just as normal. Not even close. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just average Joes like myself. You know, average Joes work hardworking individuals, but on the other side, you know, um, European descent. How do you feel about that when European elite, you know, uh, grafted a constitution and put a vision out here in theory, it sounds good. You know, in, in theory, it really sounds good, but most of those were slave owners, as the history. Oh, I know, was. I know. I, yeah, no. nation, but you can, you know, so it's, it's a big hypocrisy. One of the great ironies of all time is no, Thomas I think, I think Jefferson is, writing, all men are created equal. While well, he owns slaves. slaves right? Sure, exactly. Sure. Right. So I can you, can you even speak on something? And see, these but, are the type of things that need to be pushed into our educational system, our kids, and the conversation. We need to be you know, courageous enough, whether you're white, black, whatever your nationality is, if we're going to be serious about getting to some real solutions, you have to address it from a real standpoint. You have to put it really out there, regardless of whatever feedback you get. But I've, but I've actually gotten pushback, um, not, not in any serious kind of way, and this certainly isn't the kind of, of things we were talking about with uh, Dr. Pilgrim, images of lynchings and all that kind of thing, but I've been in... in social situations where I've uh, uh, been talking with uh, some black people maybe that I didn't know very well and I, I, I would bring something up and be almost rejected as well that's cultural you know and, and pushed mm -hmm, back mm -hmm. like you couldn't possibly understand I don't know if I can understand or not but I'd like to give it a shot 
and it, and you know to be rejected in that way, you know, and I, I guess what I'm bringing up is is there a conscious a, a conscience was there a, a a memo that went out or a text or something that said you know <laughs> hey keep it to yourself brothers you know because you know I'll have fun. well I was gonna I was gonna touch really upon maybe there's some some class differences even within the black community I mean. It strikes me that one other division we have to face big is the opportunities that are out there, and those run along the class lines. I mean, frankly, Barack Obama's kids are going to have a lot more opportunities than some, some kids of a single mother living in the north end of Flint, whether they're black or white. And I think so the, the class difference may make a difference. And, and again, in terms of achieving the American dream, the opportunity to go to a Harvard, to go to a Yale, to have the trust fund there, Gives you a lot of choices that somebody who's, like I say, who's a single mother living in the north end of Flint is never going to be able to have, probably, black or white. So I think the class difference is cut in, in a lot of ways um, across, across many racial lines. I would definitely agree, and that's why I said you really have a rich and tall. You know, right now, I mean, when GM was here, we was kind of thriving. We had that middle class thing going on. Right. GM's mm -hmm. been going for some time now. So you're really looking at more or less as a rich and poor. You know, individual struggle. We can we we can really agree to that when you look at the high water rate bills, the protests that's coming up, and things of that nature. So I don't have to really go into too much about that. But something you said, Tom, that really sparked me was, I think back the first time I met you uh -huh. when we came on your radio show with Andrea and so forth. Right. And you said something in, in regards to um, you say other black people you had conversations with. And they looked at you like you possibly couldn't relate to that. The first time I met you, if I brought up some things, I, I would have probably kind of had that prejudice or speculation about you until I got to know you. Right. I've been on your show several times, so having to know you. You know there's nothing I won't talk about. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And see, this is, this is how we get comfortable. This is how we dialogue. It has to be more of that. You know what I mean? But, yeah, but as comfortable as, as I am with you and, and, uh, and my friend Yusuf Boswell and, and, and many other people I've known and musicians, and I, we haven't even talked about, you know, the, he, he's at the door now. Okay. All right. John keeps running up there looking for Looking for, for something here. Yeah. Trying to... Oh. All right. Anyway, um, but, but I... I um, Still, we'll run into situations, and, and this uh, and this can be good for the kind of conversation that, that we're having, but I'll go into a convenience store, and there'll be four or five black people in the store, and uh, thanks, Jermaine. Um, and then all of a sudden, I'll get uncomfortable, and I don't, you know, it's, it's, it's not that I want to have a, a preconceived notion or a an inherent fear, but yet urban life dictates that there are certain things you know that you yeah. be wary of you know and and that that fight or flight thing mm. kicks in and 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 I know I'm giving off a <laughs> oh I better lock my doors vibe and and I don't mean that you, you know what I'm saying but here's Here's where the conversation, where, the, where the, the wheels leave the road in a lot of conversations about race is it becomes an opportunity to be critical of people's behaviors. And where I want to try to, to delve, if we can, is explore what are the right questions. You know, so that like these these programs that start up, whether it's uh, you know child protective services or or uh, you know the, the people that give out the bridge cards or or whoever, whatever agency, whatever organization, maybe it's a five hundred one c three or something, whatever these people are doing, what is it they should be doing differently to make programs work? Now you know you're running for school board. You know it's a you know it's a political year. It's a campaign year, um, and and there are all kinds of people. Uh, uh, you know one of the one of the constant refrains is we've got to we've got to cut spending on entitlements, and you know we got to quit mm -hmm. calling them entitlements, and 
you know, we've got to come up with these programs where it's welfare to work, and there's all this kind of rhetoric going on. What is it that these programs should be asking so that they can orient the programs to be successful, or are programs even necessary? Well, yeah. definitely some of those programs could be beneficial if they're being implemented properly and the right individuals who are uh, implementing are sincere about really helping those individuals those programs are targeted to. But uh -huh. I think that as time moved past, individuals have learned how to manipulate those programs. I was going to say, are they simply bad programs or are they badly administered? Are they decent badly, ideas but badly administered? I, I, that's a good word, yeah. badly administered. I would say a lot of those programs are badly uh, administered, definitely. And something else you said too, um, Tom, in regards to, you said um, if you would go to a corner store and you see a group of black kids, you would get a little uncomfortable. Even myself, in these times right now, I get a little uncomfortable, though I may still go in there. And I'm just the oh, same I, st way. I still go. Yeah. And and I and I and, and I try to put out a vibe that's like this is all good and normal. Right. But I know I'm uptight. There's that famous quote from Jesse Jackson. Remember that quote? Jesse Jackson's <laughs> talked about that very same issue. One time he was walking down the street in D.C. at midnight or two in the morning, and all of a sudden. A couple of black teenagers were coming toward him, and he got kind of nervous. And this is Jesse Jackson saying this stuff. So it but, is, yeah. But even the same, I would do the same. I'm over here on the east side, and it's, 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 it's a mixed culture. Yeah, and yeah. I'm, you know, I, I'm pretty much everywhere. I know people everywhere in this city. I've been here 34 years. And even when I'm in, you know. That's with, such a long time, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Great. laughs> it's white Seems area. like since lunchtime. You know, I get a little <laughs> nervous when I see the individual with the tattoos and the earrings. Oh, yeah. And, and, and the different hair colors. You know, I'm a little, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. Is this guy, is he, is he the guy who's going to put on that jacket and the, the shut up the classroom? You know what uh -huh. I mean? So right. we can get, right. you, can, you can go both ways. Right? Oh, no, no, no. Can, I, I agree No, no, I, I'm not just saying that to, to like, you know, um, to just to really to the audience, you know, it, it doesn't really matter necessarily all the time in the area, because 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 you got danger in every area, or things that make you uncomfortable, you know what I mean? I think we have to, as men and women, regardless your color or race, you have to really step up and be courageous enough. If you choose to go in whatever area to get a go to the grocery store. If you chose to go there, then you man up or you woman up and you go in that store with the intention of, I'm going in here to get what I can to get and I'm coming back out. When you start looking at things a little more like until something happens, if it does happen to you, mm -hmm. sometimes we can allow that, that prejudice to already be subconsciously getting into our brain or from media and radio and things of this nature that we don't probably heard of. So we already mm -hmm. have an expectation when we go to certain areas. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. we already have those expectations. We got to kill that because it's individuals who get millions off that type of propaganda that they do. Promote right. out here in media, internet, or wherever it may be. So well, when you come into those situations. We know there are professional hate baiters. You know, they're <laughs> out there. Hate baiters. I like that. Well, not they're, even, not even hate baiters. You know, yeah. I'm thinking here, the old, it's a, when we watch the 11 o'clock news, the old line is, if it bleeds, it leads. I mean, how many times do you watch 11 o'clock news and the first half dozen stories are, <coughs> oh, there's another shooting in the north end, there's a mugging here. This, I mean, yeah, that's a reality, but if, if you watch, if you get all your news from, from, from the half an hour, 11 o'clock news, you get a very distorted view of reality. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and something, you know, something recent that just happened in the news, I'll give you a prime example. The situation with Ray Rice and domestic violence, mm -hmm. totally mm -hmm. disagree. You should never did what he done. If that's what, how it went down, never. But even worse is when the young man, Mike Brown, Trayvon Martin, mm -hmm. and, and if I ain't mistaken, I'm gonna bring the, I can bring the papers to you Another day, Tom, it was like 20 other individuals from California, same situation where the police killed these individuals unarmed and things of this nature. That should never trump the attention of individuals of what's going on in this country. That's, that's, that's murder. That's flat out murder. Now, they took Ray Rice, an athlete, and you crucifying it, and it should be. I'm not saying that, that he was right for what he was doing. That was totally wrong. I'm against that. My mo I, I grew up as a child watching my mother go through the same thing. So I'm totally against it. 
But I sit there and watch how propaganda comes through the media like that. They would blow up more of the, the Ray Rice issue more than this cop who's yet to be arrested mm -hmm. for killing a right. young black male. It's something wrong with that. And then I brought you another situation. This was right here in Flint. I didn't even know about this. We fell asleep on this. A same similar situation. We had the state police come in. This young mm -hmm. man, I know his um, stepfather, and I met his mother. Up on, I'm passing off flyers doing my school board thing. And she seen my flyer, and she said, you was the, you was the gentleman that um, my husband's talking about. And I was like, oh, wow, this is the young man. I, I supposed to met this young man. And we was gonna, I was trying to try to mentor. Mm -hmm. He just come mm -hmm. home from prison. I don't want to go too much into the details of this story right. without their permission, but things like that get kind of pushed to the side to kind of like get the attention off what's really going on. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You have Ray Rice's wife. She obviously, whatever the reason may be, and, and people who look at it from both ends may say, well, that's just from years of however you psychologically or whatever you want to look, she's still with him because she's scared or whatever. She's still with him. The end of the day, she's still with him. But yet, we just had another outpour, another riot in St. Louis on that Mike Brown mm -hmm. issue. But yet, the media is kind of like slowly trying to get you away from it. And this is by design because that cop has yet to be arrested. But let it be the opposite sex. Do I mean, you, excuse me, the opposite it's, race. Do you think it's... Do you think it's by design or is it cultural ADD? It's by design. It's I mean, do you many, think it's, it's, it's you think it's years conspiratorial? Yes, sir. It's too many years that went by. You know, I'm a, I'm not that old time <laughs> like y'all was just laughing. I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that's right. You know, um, as Paul was mentioning, you know, when he even his class and the things that he's teaching, mm -hmm. when it was like the '60s, '70s, you had the uproar, you had the youth, and everybody into it, civil rights, all that thing theme going, you know, and um, so I had an opportunity to kind of grow from that, learn from that, and to deal with what we're dealing with right now. It's by design. You know, history just repeats itself, but those who really study history have mastered the loopholes, and this is what you get. They master how to get through those loopholes. You know, because back then, we'll be, we'll be in the streets tearing it up. Right. You know, back then, that's how... Um, serious and, and consciously aware everyone were, not just some. Compared to now, you have a dis um a disconnection, so to say, between our elders and our youth on certain matters. And that's also by design. And some people like keeping it that way. Because if you look at any movement back then, it was always the youth that got on those front lines. Mm -hmm. With sure. the Dr. Martin Luther King's, the Malcolm X, Nelson Mandela's, and so forth. You can do the history on it. It was those youth and individuals who study that, they know this. But, but let's talk about, the, uh, about role models and the importance of role models because um, it, it, it seems to me that there's um, there obviously, and I, and I when I I found a cartoon on uh, uh, Facebook that I used to post and, and promote that we were going to be having this discussion today. And uh, it shows two people talking, and one is saying that um, race relations have come a long way, and the other one is saying race relations have a long way to go. And I, I thought that was... Uh, pretty important point to make. We have come a long way. You know, you're running for uh, school board. Um, we have another, uh, a number of black people in elected and, and uh, leadership positions. Are they serving as role models? Are they, are they looked at as role models? Or are they looked at as sellouts? Well, from our standpoint, if, 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 if we're going to look we at, right. we, we'll just Come look on. at the black right. leadership. Oh, we're going to need another chair for Tim. Well, you know, I deal, you know, um, and Tim's in here, and he can get in here in a second. Um, we deal with a lot of the youth, those at-risk individuals and things of that nature that you may term, whatever term you may term. 
and I talked to him and I asked hey, him. Tim, tell you what, we're going to be taking a break here in a few minutes. We'll bring you in in the second yeah, hour. It's all right, John. We're, we're going to bring him in in the second hour. And we asked that question. So to, to that youth, that population we like to call forgotten population, they will say about the black leadership, and, it, and to a degree even myself, are puppies, paid leadership. There's a lot of paid leadership in front of African Americans in this country to pacify us, from keep us from achieving or advancing as a group. It's okay for certain sections, certain individuals. All to right, now here's them. here's where the uh, y you know the the political talk show host <laughs> kicks in and says, "When you get elected to the school board, then are you going <laughs> to no longer be connected? Are you going to be part of the conspiracy?" Uh, well, <laughs> you've been knowing me, Tom, you've been knowing me probably, what, over a year now? But but I'm making a bigger point with no, this. No, no, I'm no, messing with you. Yeah, I know. Because we're friends and I yeah. can do that. I can, I can tease you a but little does, bit. But does anybody go through that transformation? If you start out as a man of the people, you get elected, then after a couple of years, are you, do you lose that you contact? Some, that some, that some, in, some, some individuals do. But here's yeah. the thing with me. I don't even consider myself a politician. I'm a principal leader. Before I fear, well, you're never a politician until you've been elected, or, or any system, <laughs> or anything. No, this, this. If it, I'm telling you, any listener, listening right now, this is what you're getting when you elect Leon L. Alamin for any position. It does not change. I stand on my morals and my principles. If it is against any human being, white, black, Asian, whatever it may be, if it's unjust and it goes against what I understand from the Bible, from the Quran, to be just laws towards God, I will not agree with you. I'm not for sale. I'm not going to agree with it. If it's going to, if it will destroy the progress we have in an educational system, city council, whatever the situation may be, mm -hmm. I, I fear God more than I fear anything on this earth. So don't elect me if you're looking for somebody who's going to get paid and bought and dance and sings to the tune because that ain't going to happen. I'm telling you now. But if you want somebody who's going to stand up and say, look, I don't know. That's not right. This ain't what the people over here saying. A couple of y'all over here may enjoy it, but the majority, what about these individuals who don't have a voice? Mm -hmm. That's me. I'm for everybody. You know what I mean? So when you elect me, that's what you get. It's just a title. At the end of the day, I'm a human being. What What do you think is the bigger threat to racial harmony? Um, pigmentation or piggy banks? Piggy <laughs> banks. Individuals are, more, the money. individuals are more worried about their money and how they get it than there is anything else. If, 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 if right now, if it was me, say for instance, the, in, the situation in St. Louis was right here in Flint, you know what I'd do? We should do it anyway. Just to prove a point, and I'll prove it to you. Economic shutdown. Quit spending your money with individuals who don't value your life or support the communities and things that you come into. You've been reading Malcolm X, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, that's my man. That's my yeah. man. That's my man, him, Nelson Mandela, uh, Tim Wise, and he's a Caucasian, and, and, and go look him up. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he And I really respect that man. I respect you, Tom, and other individuals. It's not See. just Malcolm and them, but though that's one of the books. But, one but, of we, got, but we got to talk about who people can look up to because I don't think, I, I think there's rampant lack of respect for authority in the black community. I think there are a great many white people who are starting to lose respect for authority in huge numbers. I think so, I, yeah. And, and, and I... And I wonder if, if that trend is the reason we're seeing militarization of local police departments. You know, seeing the tanks roll in and the M16s and, you know, some of the things. You know, they're, they're wrestling about that in Ferguson now because yeah, they've realized right. they're wheeling in. Oh, yeah. The tanks right. is, yeah. is inflaming it's the situation. It's ca caused more trouble than it's been solved. And yeah. In fact, the, the programs now, we're uncovering how many, how many school districts, I just heard on the radio coming in here this afternoon, how many school districts have got grenade launchers that they receive from this particular military program and armored vehicles. These are, these are not inner city ghettos. These are schools that where, where they've got these armored vehicles of one kind or another. 
So, so yeah, those, that's, that's another issue altogether about how we, we formulate the police and, and, our, and arm them. And, and probably turning them into a military force does more harm than good for these kind of situations. Well, I know it's, uh, this is a huge it's hu topic. It is fascinating. And, and, and I want to and I, I want to continue this we have another hour to go hopefully we have another special guest calling in during the, the second hour we'll see if that takes place but in the meantime there are a number of other things that I want to get into um, thanks again uh, to uh, dr. David Pilgrim from uh, Ferris State University and the Jim Crow Museum there uh, for joining us for the first part of the conversation also to uh, Leon El Alamin from three hours who's also a uh, candidate for the uh, Flint Community School Board and uh, and also uh, we're gonna we're gonna add into the conversation uh, Tim from 3Rs who's uh, gonna be joining us in just a couple of minutes but we are gonna take a uh, oh probably four or five minute break and then we'll do uh, hour two but I also want to acknowledge uh, Flint's premier political pundit <laughs> always good to be here every Paul, Tuesday. Paul Rosicki <laughs> from uh, my community college and uh, also Jim Wilson, or John Wilson, rather, in uh, Master Control uh, here at FlintTalkRadio.com. We're here every Tuesday with the Tom Sumner Program for the Internet. Not always as heavy a discussion as we're having. And, and there are so many political things that we oh, can be talking about. Yeah, you know, I mean. Snyder's doing his uh, town hall meetings. Uh, he's right. got about ten of those scheduled. Uh, hoping to get people who are undecided to show up. He doesn't want the people that support him, and he doesn't want the people uh, who don't support him. He wants undecided because that's wonder. how I we wonder. can have a real good conversation. A yeah. uh, number of other things. Uh, the, the Detroit's uh, Detroit's coming out of bankruptcy. Well we on its way out A number of, of major proposals coming down Flint. We just had a, hear a, a forum last night on these six proposals for the city of Flint. There'll be a couple of those coming up in the next few weeks as well. One at the library, one at uh, and, and we're going to get into a bunch of that. Uh, yeah, a lot of that next stuff coming in the next couple of weeks. Um, also, uh, I, I, I think next week's show is going to be themed, how about them apples? <laughs> because it's, it's apple season in Michigan. It's, it's, We've had a bumper crop, and I also have an opportunity uh, to talk to um, uh, one of the leading Foodies from a national magazine. Oh, okay. We'll, we'll have that conversation with us. But you're going to bring Charlie Miller in here. Too. Oh, that'd be fun. Yeah. That'd be fun. <laughs> anyway, uh, we are going to take a short break. We'll be back with the uh, second hour of the Tom Sumner program for the internet here on yeah. FlintTalkRadio.com. So, uh, you know, I guess go look at uh, pictures of um, cute little kittens and, uh, <laughs> and join us for the second half yeah. coming up in about five <laughs> minutes or so. <laughs> 